All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining SuperCon today. I've got the uh, wonderful Dan Jurgens with us, and Ryan Stoic is here for uh, to help out with the interview as well. Um, I'm Brian Brockmeyer, and uh, founder of SuperCon is my claim to fame. So let's that's all I'll say about myself. Uh, Ryan, you want to introduce yourself as well? Uh, well, hi everyone. My name is Ryan Stoic, and I have been affiliated tangentially with SuperCon since the first year. I actually performed stand-up comedy, ironically, at their first uh, at their first convention, and just kind of been in around the edges and attending ever since. And it's uh, always been a good experience. Uh, I do local stand-up comedy, and I am a aspiring comic book creator it hasn't happened yet but it will soon uh and that's pretty much it awesome thanks ryan so uh if you if you didn't know dan uh dan Rickens is, is is a legend and uh we're super excited to have him i know that ryan and i are both huge fans so i'm trying my best not to fanboy out again i did it to him last time i met him and i'm sure ryan's I'm, the same boat just trying to keep a lid on everything. That's all that's going on over here. <laughs> it's all good. Don't worry about it. In my oh. head, it's all just be cool. Come on, man. Be cool. Um, so, Dan, uh, creator of Booster Gold, Doomsday, Hank Henshaw. Um, you've worked on Marvel and DC. You've done some really big titles. Um, so, in your world, what, what's a typical day look like for someone that does these legendary things every day? Oh, man, I work um, pretty normal business hours. I mean, I'm up at six every day, uh, you know, try and get in the office bright and early and try and keep it to a normal day. Um, I'm always working in evenings and or, or the weekends. I mean, part of it is when you, especially when you're a writer, you never stop because your mind is always going, right? And you know, you will find story solutions in the oddest of places and the weirdest of times. And it's like, hold on, I've got to make note of this. Um, you've got to process it somehow. You're sitting in a movie and, and you know, you back when we could go to movies, I might. Have. Right. Um, yeah. But, you know, and, and the ideas come. But by and large, I try and keep it limited to kind of a normal day. And in part because I like to be in sync with the rest of the world. That's awesome. Um, so, I mean, you, you mentioned working quite a bit. So it's uh, your your day is like all day, pretty much every day. You're you're doing something that's that's pretty incredible. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, but that is also. I mean, that is the creative process, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it is one of those things that you cannot turn on and off, and so you have to go with it, really, as it happens. Awesome. So you said you mentioned uh, going to movies and such. Is there something that you're currently reading or something you're listening to or watching um, that you've been really enjoying lately? Um, I think I, right now, the key is more trying not to get trapped in something. And that I think is the sort of the undertow of where we're at in terms of circumstances now. Cause I know so many people who have been pulled under by that, whether it's the news or politics or whatever. And I think now it's more a point of just trying to stay out of that. And, and, and because that is happening to a lot of people. It's sad and unfortunate, but the idea is, and, and I think this is always important from a creative standpoint, to enjoy what you do and have a lot of fun when you do it. Because if you do as a creator, I think that, I think that, um, is something that the audience can pick up on. I mean, as a reader, I always knew that I could pick up on when creators were really in sync and having a good time on the book. And I still think now it's true that when you go into a store and pick up, say, say you go into a store and pick up 20 comics, you can always identify like the three, four or five where the writers and artists are really into it and all pistons are firing and it works and you can see the enthusiasm on the page. And I think that's really important. When you when you do write a story, uh, like you said, the bolt of inspiration kind of hits whenever what you, I have to wake up from this dream and make a note or I'm sitting in this movie. So that happens when it happens. But when you do sit down to actually write, do you find you have to do anything to actually get into the heads 
space, if you will, with the characters you're writing, or does it just when you sit down and you have a rough idea, does it just kind of flow from the fingertips, as they say? I think Ryan, the answer to that is D, all of the above, and and all and right, it's because there there is no um, hardcore solution in terms of where ideas come from. It's not like I I can say, well, I have to write an issue. I'm going to go sit in the magic chair because whenever I sit in that magic chair, I get magic ideas. It, you could be out for a walk. And, and sometimes the best thing is to get away from the office, get out of that environment and change things up. Um, I, I am a firm believer that we solve some of these problems while we sleep. Cause I, honestly, some days I'll just, I'll get up and I'll know what the end answer is. I don't know how I got there and I don't know how my brain process it, but I know it'll happen. So I, I think as it's like I said earlier, ideas, inspiration, thoughts, notions, concepts, they can come from anywhere at any time in almost any circumstance. And it's the writer's uh, job to take all those disparate elements and figure out how to put them together in a story. Awesome. So is part of your process too with the artwork, um, you know, you're a pretty awesome artist as well. So is that creative process the same there? I mean, you, you designed Doomsday, you created this, this awesome character. Um, what was that like creating him? Well, I mean, um, at that time, so, you know, we were planning out this story um, and I had always been wanting to do, and I had little notes jotted on a yellow legal pad that I went into a story conference with two ideas. One was, and then this pad I just wrote, Death of Superman and Monster Trashes Metropolis was the second one. And as we put all of these things together to start to become the idea of Death of Superman, we started to use this, well, what if that's the monster? Instead of it being, say, Lex Luthor or Brainiac or something like that, what if we created someone new? And as we were in the meeting talking about it, I actually did like this little thumbnail sketch of Doomsday, which was somewhat like he ended up turning out to be, but it was enough to get everybody interested and kind of get the discussion going because I wanted a physical, bestial sort of menace for Superman to fight. And that's where the bones came in as something that looked a little threatening. It gave him that jagged sort of form. Um, they also served as something of an exoskeleton. So, Again, it was, you know, we had discussions about what it would be, of what this monster would be, and then I did a doodle, then you talk about it some more, then later I did a more finished sketch. I mean, the, the whole idea is, and I was trying to tell people this, creation is not this straight line. Creation goes like this, up and down and, you know, in and out and back and forth, and then ultimately you get to the end of it and hopefully you have something worthwhile. And so that's where a lot of it is idea exploration, whether it's a visual and, and sketching different concepts for a character or how they might look or what the page might even look like to writing down different ideas if you're just scripting. When it comes to uh, creating characters, I have to have a question in regards to that as well. You know, you've uh, created so many things for the Superman mythos and so many things for existing characters at DC. Uh, you've even created original characters like Booster Gold. And back when you did that, they put him right into his own series, which is kind of irregular these days. But And, and you don't have to give away anything if, if you don't want to. But is, is there something rattling around in your head still about an, uh, another original character that you'd really want to give their own spotlight to for a uh, for a series is there is there something you've got deep in your recesses of your mind yeah there are always a couple of ideas that i have and and sometimes it's less a character and more um a theme or a concept that i'd like to explore and you know at some point i will get to it uh it, it's weird because so often ideas you have some ideas that percolate for a couple of years before you actually get to use yes. them or realize them. And other times, and I wish there were more times like this, it is that lightning bolt out of the blue, right? And boy, it's easier when that happens. It's much more convenient, <laughs> but that's rarely sure. the case. I'll buy three when you come up with it and it's out. Just uh... Okay. <laughs> that's a deal. <laughs> 
So, so during this, this process, um, you know, is it, is it difficult to hand off some of these characters you've created? Um, you know, you, you did this, this Lewis and Clark, or Lewis and Clark um, story arc, and you've got Jonathan Cannon here, and you've kind of created this universe for uh, Superman in this new world that he's living in. Um, when when it's, the time comes to hand off, is it difficult to do that? Um, or is well, it, I think, you're excited, how does it you feel? You know, it, it, every circumstance is different. And uh, in, the, in the case of, you know, John Kent, when we did that, it became a point where, okay, we're gonna take, um, I had, I had done the Lois and Clark series and John Kent, which really was a precursor to the entire rebirth effort. That's what set up a lot of stuff that became rebirth and that we could then run with it in terms of having um, Lois and Clark married again with John. So at that point, that wasn't so much a handoff as more of a transition because uh, Peter Tomasi and Pat Gleason and I all went into the office and we sat down and started to talk about how we would handle the characters because they were going to move on from what I did with the uh, miniseries, Lois and Clark, into a an, uh, bi-weekly ongoing with both the Superman and action titles. So it wasn't a handoff as much as it was a transition with other people coming into it, but we were all in a room together and able to talk about it. So I think with that in mind, then that is something that ideally that's the way it works. Other times it's more of a cold, you know, you're stepping off and someone else is coming in, but they want to go in a completely different direction, which they should be able to do. And, and both, both methods are legitimate ways of doing comics and moving on to books. But um, yeah, when something is near and dear to your heart, it's nicer to have a transition that is planned and organized and that everybody is a part of. I just have to take a moment and say when we're talking about the character of John Kent, that was, I'm going to fanboy out here for a second. That idea was just fantastic. Because uh, it's one of those things that you figure maybe would shake up the status quo too much. Like there's, there were always imaginary stories in the early 60s and 70s about what if Superman and Lois got married and had a child. But it wasn't something that fans would figure would ever actually happen because people like to kind of keep things relatively the same. And then to add something as, you know, that would shake everything up as Superman and Lois having a child and then to branch stories off of that, it was just great. Thank you. I appreciate it, it, that. It opened up a door for all kinds of new stories, which I guess was the goal, but it sure worked. Well, I think part of what John does is this. And, you know, so many people, you know, they, they, they look at Superman and they say, or they ask, well, how do you come up with stories for a character that is that powerful? And one of the keys is, and I was trying to explain this, is that if you're just trying to come up with a story for Superman, you will run into obstacles. If you're trying to come up with stories for Clark Kent, then that's, I think, for me, the path to success because he is a human first and not Kryptonian. He is human first. He was raised here on Earth as a human. And I think what both Lois Lane and John do is they help to humanize the character of Superman, which then should give Superman you know, harder choices to make as he fights whatever he has to fight against or whoever he runs up against. So I think if you put that all together, it, it helps to actually say something about Superman as you come up with those stories. Totally see it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, the, hum the, the humanizing of this God basically on earth. Um, yeah, and that's, I think that's, as I was growing up reading Superman in particular, like really what spoke to me is he was a very grounded character. Which yeah, he he should, I think really Superman should be the most grounded character in comics. And, and I think of all the superheroes, so many of them are damaged. I mean, Batman in many ways is a broken individual, right? And Superman is not. To me, he should always be the most centered, the most grounded character in comics. And, and I think that then says something about his character. And that's what you can build stories off of. And I find that very interesting. And, you know, I, I wrote Thor for um, 
almost seven years. And a lot of people would say, well, how can you, why would you want to write Thor when you're writing Superman? They're, they're the same. I would say, no, they're not at all. <laughs> Thor is, you know, you had used the word godlike with Superman. Thor is a god. And so that's where you start to see the differences. And Thor doesn't see himself as human. Thor embraces that aspect of his background of having, you know, grown up on Asgard. So they are wildly different characters at that point. And that's what gives them wildly different stories. Absolutely. Do, do you enjoy, um, like with your run with um, Batman Beyond, is it, is, it, is it fun, is it rewarding when you jump from like a Clark Kent to a, a, a Bruce Wayne, particularly a Bruce Wayne that's now much older and gone through much more? Yeah, it is. Um, I think as writers, we're energized by writing different types of things. And what I enjoyed so much about Batman Beyond is that it was its own unit. It's, it's a set of stories that take place in the future where you can play around with the future sort of as you want to um, and feature other characters as they might develop in the DC universe. And I think it's fun to tell the stories of a Batman who is equipped with all sorts of technology. Um, so that to me became a very interesting thing. And I actually ended up enjoying it more than I thought I would going into it, which is one of the reasons I've been doing it for so long. Awesome. I'll stop taking your questions, Ryan. Let you see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Got, got, so got a dirty thief over here. Um, <laughs> actually, it leads into one that I wanted to ask um, with, with, um, so many characters that you can choose from that have already been established. Has there, is there one still that, because you've done so many great stories for so many different characters across all of the different companies and publishers there have been pretty much, but is, is there one that's still, when you think about it, you go, Oh man, I'd really like to take a crack at that character. That would be really great. Is there, is there still one of those for you? There, there are a couple out there. I mean, for the most part, uh, I've always been able to do, or I've been able to do just about everything I've wanted to and work on all the characters I've wanted to. Uh, I think um, I, I have always found, uh, you know, Tony Stark, Iron Man to be absolutely fascinating. I, I would have a lot of fun with that. Uh, and I've still never really spent much time with Green Lantern. I did. And by that, I mean, Hal Jordan. Um, so those are a couple that are out there, but there again, I have other things I want to do as well. And, and I'm sort of not in the mode of necessarily wanting to chase that stuff down anymore. I think it's, it's also fun to just be able to kind of pursue other interests at this point. Absolutely. So what are some of those other interests? Are you, are you looking to, to branch out away from comic books or just within the comic book realm or what? No, it's still within comics. I mean, okay. to so me, tell me more. It, no, it, <laughs> look, it's the same as um, when I was a kid, I wanted to write and draw stories. And that's still primarily it for me, this, this idea that, you know, we get to work with these fabulous characters and these incredible concepts and to be able to write them and draw them, you know, it's, it's what I do. And I, people will say, well, what do you do for a living? And do you think of yourself as a writer or an artist? And I say, no, I'm a storyteller. And so to me, the easiest way to do that, the purest way of doing that is still in comics, because especially when you're a writer artist, if you're doing both, that's when you really get to control the product and theoretically the effect it will have on readers. It is just plain the greatest medium there is. I, yeah, I've, I've always thought that and it's, there's nothing like it in the world. No, and it's, it's the magic that, um, you know, we, we think of movies and TV and we remember the shows and we might remember certain shots. But it's amazing to me that, you know, we're all like this, right? You, you can pick up a comic book and maybe it was one that you had when you were 15, 16 years old. And you just poured over it like time and time again, right? And then you know, many years later, you know, and, and you open that up and you know what each, not just each page is, but what each panel is. And you're just like really locked in on it. And you just go, wow, I remember the feeling that I had when I read this. And it still gives me that. And then you can see 
as you look back on it, why that is. What was it that was on the page that that motivated you and made it work? And then you see that, and it's so cool. And um, we, we're that's something we all have in common that way. We all have our own books that that applies to. But when you have it, it's a great feeling. So what's your what's your um, what's your biggest influences as, as you were growing up? Mentioned your childhood as far as comics and, and maybe just pop culture in general or movies or. Well, you know, the first influence for me was the Batman TV show because I didn't even know comics existed. And when I say TV show, I mean the live action Adam West version. I didn't even know comics existed. And that show came on and there were some older guys in the neighborhood that, that had them. And I, I saw them on their um, front step looking at these four color pamphlets one warm summer night. And it's just like, Oh, and they even have Batman and Robin in them. And I watch Batman and Robin on TV and oh, wow, this is all coming together for me. What a wonderful world. <laughs> and, and really, that's what first got me interested in it was these colorful pictures on the page. And then, you know, after that, it's, it's really seeing the work done by such incredible creators, whether it's like Stan Lee and Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby at Marvel or at DC more Neil Adams and Kurt Swan and so many others. And just what, what I sort of got interested in is, is not only the differences among the characters at that point, but the differences in the creators as well that came across on the page. And that's, and once you start to notice the differences, well, then you start to realize why some things work for you and other things don't. And you just keep getting into it deeper and deeper. And that's how it worked for me. And I think my inspiration just came from that entire sense of it being this wonderful visual world that opened up with so many possibilities and ideas. And that's still what fuels me to this day. You really can go anywhere with it too, anywhere your mind can go. Anything you can imagine, you can put that on the page, especially if you're in a position that you're in where you're both writing the story and able to draw the art right, uh, right and just anywhere you can if you can think of it you can put it down if you can make it look cool which you certainly can <laughs> you've been doing it for many years um but is there um um hold on here uh <laughs> anything you wanted to do story-wise uh, and I'm sure we all have them as, as writers and storytellers, but anything you may have really had your heart set on that didn't, didn't exactly pan out the way you wanted to, or, oh, that's a really missed opportunity kind of feeling. And any, any one of those that I'm sure there have been many over the years that really stick out? Uh, there, you know, there are a couple of ideas that I wanted to do that I've still not gotten on the page and I'm not really ready to say anything about those. Sure. You never know. I still might be able to do it at some point. Um, then, uh, you know, there are other things you do where it sounds like it's going to be the greatest thing ever. <laughs> 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 and, and for whatever reason, it ends up not being the greatest thing ever. And, and sometimes it's because of circumstances. Sometimes it's because you as the creator, me, you know, you screw it up. Um, other times it's just like you give it the absolute best you can and somehow all of a sudden you're like on chapter three of it or something like that and you just realize, you know what? This just wasn't as good as I thought it was gonna be. Those things happen and they happen to all of us. And, uh, and then you get done with it and like six months later you realize, yeah, well, there was this point on, you know, um, the second issue, page 13, where I should have gone left instead of right, whatever. And, and you just look back and see the mistakes you made. Um, by and large, though, fortunately, that doesn't happen very often. Is there is there any particular titles or any storylines, story arcs that you can think of that you were like, oh, man, this is just the worst thing I've ever come up with or it was a total <laughs> failure? Have you ever felt that yeah, way about yeah, me? Yeah, let's this talk one's about my bond. Suck. <laughs> uh, I, I have always said that um, when I did, when I was on Superman the first time around, um, I did a story where Toy Man uh, kills Cat Grant's son. And 
it, it was, I think, a very powerful story. And I think it said something about both Toy Man and Cat Grant and Superman. But at the same time, in retrospect, uh, it symbolized a failure for Superman. And, and it's not that he failed in the moment to save the child, but uh, in retrospect, I think I would have handled it differently. And I'm not sure I would have had him die. Um, I, I've always looked back and, and thought that I would, yeah, that I would have done something different there. I remember that. Uh, definitely powerful. Yep. And yeah, and it was very, it was one of the reasons it was powerful is because it wasn't a typical Superman story at that point. And so it was a bit of a, a way of doing something kind of shocking. And I think, I, I think it's a cheap move to shock readers just for the sake of shock that it has to make more sense than that. And, and I think it, had we handled it differently where it had longer lasting ramifications for Superman, then maybe it might've come off better. Certainly. I, there, there were some callbacks, I think, to it in the, in, for a little while after it had happened. Um, but yeah, I, I can totally see where you're coming from with that. Yeah, yeah. So, awesome. I'll take your question again, Ryan. Very, very <laughs> squeezed in here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. It, uh, I'm, I was just thinking back to that story, and, and when I did read it, it, it felt, uh, and, and I guess it was supposed to, but it, but it felt like it was uh, much darker than you usually get for a Superman story, which is, is part of why it stuck with so many readers. But I can definitely see where that would want, where you would want to have some sort of uh, more lasting implications of it. Like they, they, they had a few allusions to it after it happened, but afterwards it was sort of on to the next thing because we have more monthly books to put out and, yeah, I can definitely see where that would have been something that would have been worth exploring down the line. Yeah, um, yeah. and you know, so it's, and again, it's not a major deal. And the, the other one I come back to is when I first did Booster Gold, uh, you really saw a writer kind of figuring things out on the page. And um, it's, it's one of those that had I, when I started, had I known what I knew a few years later, when I started, it would have been um, a better, stronger book, and, and I think would have been received better. But that's part of what happens in comics. And, and we're fortunate when we get someone uh, uh, from an editorial standpoint who is willing to let us you know, learn while we're obviously on the job. And because I do look back at that and I can see the mistakes I made and how that same creator um, a year, maybe two years down later, could have given it a much better launch. There was, uh, I love Booster's character development throughout the years. I mean, he's really come a long way and he's been, he's been part of some pretty big stories. Um, yeah, I was gonna actually ask you, was that all intentional? Did you have that in mind that he would be this big part of the, the greater universe, particularly with the most recent rebirth and stuff? Yeah, I think if you go back to the last issue or two of Booster Gold Volume 1, which would have been like 1987, I think, somewhere in there. I mean, um, maybe 88. I, I mean, Booster, even at that very end, there's, I'm talking the very end of his series, we said Booster Gold was destined for bigger things because even then we were talking about this idea that, he could have a much bigger role in the DC universe. It took longer than I would have thought to make it all a reality, but it eventually did. And um, I, you know, I gratified by that. And I think there's always this place for Booster um, because he's very elastic that because he is a time traveler, you know, he can fit into different types of stories than many other characters can and also control the setting that way. And so, you know, we have him coming up in issues 48 and 49 of Batman Beyond. So we finally get him traveling into the future, things like that, which is a lot of fun. So I think there are a lot of different ways, fun ways to use Booster. Sure, it's, it's cool seeing like in video games and in my uh, television and um, yeah, he's, he's a cool character. I've, I've yeah. been a big fan. Yeah, sure. and, and seriously, from a creative standpoint, one of the things that's, that is cool uh, is that when characters that you created end up in different mediums, be it video games, um, be it 
animation or even live action, when you see that stuff realized in different mediums on the screen, however it might be, it's a thrill and there's no question about it. It's always a lot of fun. I do remember once, um, I, and this might be, sound weird coming from a comic book fan, but I wasn't the biggest fan of the Smallville television show when it was on TV. Uh -huh. um, because he was doing everything he was supposed to do as Superman before he was Superman. But right. uh, I, rem I, rem I remember hearing one night, Booster Gold's going to be on Smallville this week. Really? Well, we're going to set the DVR here. And, and that is an episode that I was sure to catch because Booster Gold always was a character that resonated. Because when he started out, there's not a lot of likable qualities about him. It's like when you when you read the story, it's like, wow, you know. But that's that's the the goal where you think, what a jerk, and then that, that character morphs into the the character he was always meant to be over time, which you know is the the reason why he had so many great developments and great stories over the years. Right, and if you go back to say eighty four uh, and eighty five when I created the character and everything, I mean. The DC mainline characters were more homogenous then, more cardboard-like. And so I definitely wanted to do something different that was not your typical DC characters. And he wasn't. And it was also planned from the start that we would see this character grow and evolve. Uh, and that did come through. So I think that's all important. It did really make him stand out, especially because one, he was original character, and, and two, um, Dark and Sinister was kind of all the rage at that point when he came around, and, and that wasn't the, the feel of that book either. So it was something different all around. Right. I always enjoyed the uh, interactions with Blue Beetle and, and Guy Gardner and those guys too. That was almost fun. Oh, yeah. The, the Justice, Justice League stuff was, was yeah. terrific, and a lot of it was – because the characters in the Justice League at that time, whether it was Captain Marvel or Guy Gardner or Batman or Booster or Beetle, I mean, you had some very well-defined uh, characters that that you put them all together and it was a lot of fun. I mean, how could it not be? So <laughs> it, it was, those were great days. That, that might be my favorite iteration of the Justice League, honestly, um, just because of the, yeah, the difference in the characters and just the way they played off each other. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it's part of that eternal debate that said the Justice League should be the seven um, most notable or most powerful characters in the DC universe, when instead, the fact that it was, I thought, you know, the Justice League International days with that crew, that was still more fun to read. I mean, come on. <laughs> and that, that was what was driving the whole book is like these this whole team is nobody you've ever heard of you know in a mainstream sense and and it carried the book to some really great stuff for years and years yes it did absolutely <clears throat> Ryan, you up or you want me to go now the next the next <laughs> question i have is is usually one that you save to the end but uh are there any projects that you're uh developing now or that you'll be moving into that you can say anything about? Uh, the one that's going to be uh, first up um, that is coming out in January is a project called Generations Shattered uh, that I am writing with Rob Venditti and Andy Schmidt. And it's, it's a 80 page giant in which we see different DC characters taken from different points in DC history and put together as a team. And there is some advanced stuff out there and that shows that we have Commandy and we have um, Batman as he looked when he came out in 1939. We have Booster Gold, uh, we have Steel, we have Dr. Light, uh, we have Superboy and Sinestro during his Green Lantern days. And I think that's going to make for a fun and very different story. Uh, that comes out in January. And then we have a few things that uh, we can't yet talk about. Sorry to say. Oh, we That's ain't okay. heard nothing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is it? Is it which iteration of, of Superboy do you have coming in? Um. Well, the cover didn't show which version of Superboy we oh, Okay. So oh, clever boy. A mystery for some. Yes. Okay. Uh, awesome. There is that uh, Earth One is the the evil Superboy, right? He's 
constantly trying to redeem himself. And, oh, you mean uh, Superboy Prime? Superboy Prime, there you go, yeah. Yeah, De- it is not Superboy yeah. Prime. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited to see it. Great. Definitely. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're working on it now. It's, it's, we, we've got some great art. Um, each issue is going to have a, uh, you know, a group of different artists because it is 80 pages. And there's some great stuff coming in. I think people are really going to like it. So, yeah, Generation Shattered number one out in January. Are you going to be doing art for that as well as story? You know, the I did the um, setup story that was in Detective Comics 1027. Uh, I did a Batman story in that that was inked by Kevin Nolan that I'm very happy with. I would like to do more. We'll have to see how much time I have to do so. Awesome. My, uh, growing up, so I've got, I've got this idea of, of what art should look like, particularly Superman, and, and a lot of it was what you were contributing to at the time, so my idea of what Superman is supposed to look like is, is your artwork from the 90s. Oh, thank and you. so um, anytime I get to see your artwork in a comic book, I get very excited about it. Um, I can pick out a cover that you've done, you know, just on the shelf, and I'll grab it immediately. Um, so... I'll stop trying to flatter you too much here, but get into the question. Uh, so when, when, you, when you're growing up, you, you find comics, you're loving this stuff. How did you learn how to draw? When did this come into play? Um, I mean, I started when I was young. And, uh, you know, I was always drawing as a kid. And I, you know, even when I was in like second grade, I can remember you know, we'd have art class in school and my stuff would kind of look a little different, a little better than what my classmates were doing. And I was always into it. I always pursued it. And so even at night um, or during the summer, you know, I'd always find time to draw almost every day because that's how I wanted to express myself. And what I always say is, that just as kids who really want to be a musician, you never have to tell them to practice as much as they feel this, this need to sort of express themselves either with a guitar or at a keyboard or whatever. I think for artists, it's the same way that you just feel the need to have to do that. So you sit down and do it on your own and it's how you enjoy spending your time. And that was certainly part of it for me. Um, And I started and, you know, it was always this, this calling in a way that I, that I wanted to answer and I just always wanted to pursue it. So, you know, through your school years, you're kind of self-taught such as it is, you're you're making all sorts of mistakes and everything. But um, then after high school, I went to the Minneapolis of college in art and design where I majored in graphic design and illustration, Um, got a couple of great student internships Uh, But within like six months or so after graduating, I was working for DC because um, they had a writer artist who was making an appearance here in town. I stopped and showed him my work at the same time. They were sort of looking for someone to draw Warlord and they gave me a shot and I've been around ever since. That's awesome. You're like the kid that everyone would look at when the teacher's like, we're going to do a project. You know, the art art stuff. (laughs) Yeah. And they all smile at you. No one. Yeah. 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 I was also always the kid. You know, and and people tease me about this to this day because I was also the kid, you know, you'd be sitting in class. And this was true in both high school and college. But the teacher would start talking and I'd try to take notes. But then pretty (laughs) soon I'd start drawing and I'd- You've got a pencil in your hand after all. And then, you know, you'd have a note page with three words on it and the rest is all some kind of big drawing. (laughs) And uh, even to this day, I'll have friends who say, oh yeah, back in such and such class when you were supposed to be taking notes and I'd say, aha. I was just working out my future career problems. So I was way ahead of the game. Not behind, ahead. So, I may or may not have seen doodles on the back of sales receipts. Yeah, you may. Exactly, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's how it goes. I can neither confirm nor deny, but I may have seen those. <laughs> but, yeah, I was that guy. I was that kid. That's and awesome. we, all, we all have uh, a story as, as comic book fans or as professionals uh, about the moment where you decide where the lightning bolt hits, uh, I just I don't just want to read these. I want to make these. I want to do this when I grow up. What was that story for you? For me, um, 
I, I, it wasn't a moment, but I, and I talked a little bit about this earlier. I think for me, it was starting to really understand. I, I mean, so when you're like in third grade or whatever, you see all these comics and you don't really realize what makes them different, that there are different people who do them. It feels more like they're stamped out of a machine of some kind and it, you're, you're reading it more for the characters. Um, I think for me, it was more around like that sixth grade level, seventh grade, where I really started to notice the difference in creators. And I'd see an artist like Neil Adams and how much his work would be so different from what else was there. And that would interest me. Or Jack Kirby or Walter Simonson or Mike Grell or Dave Cockrum or so many others or John DeSema that that's what started to do it for me is seeing the differences in how people drew. And that is really what intrigued me. And so as I started to draw, then it that somehow brought more meaning to what I was trying to pursue on my own as an artist. And it's a hard thing to explain, but I think starting to understand the differences in all the comics that were out there is part of what really got me even more interested in them and in pursuing it myself. What advice would you give somebody that is trying to break into comic books? Um, you know, whether it's a younger person or somebody maybe, you know, getting to that age where they're going to go to college. Uh, I, I think it is whatever, be it as a writer or be it as an artist, you've got to keep doing it. Uh, the thing that I see so much of that I get frustrated by is someone will bring me their work to show it to me at a convention. And this is a very common story where let's say they want to be an artist and they have a portfolio that has room for like 25 pages and they show me two pages that are penciled and they, then a couple pages of pencils and then the next page has just got stick figures on it and there's not much there. And, you know, you, you've got to have more than that done in this sense that you've got to show me you have the passion to finish it because if you have that passion to finish it, you will be better. You, you will have a better product. Um, so it is to keep working no matter what. If you're a writer, th this sounds overly simplistic, but it isn't. Uh, if you're a writer, write. If you're an artist, art. You know, draw, <laughs> whatever. And, and don't make it just be comics. Let it be other things. If read stuff that is not comics. If you're an artist, look at art that is not just comics. Open yourself up to other things and then take the time to learn some of the craft that goes into it. And this works, you know, if you're 14, you should still be looking at perspective books trying to understand perspective. You should still be looking at books trying to understand light sources. If you're 14, you should still be reading other writers and books about writing so that you kind of get a feel for things outside of just comics. And I think the key is to want to be a writer who happens to write comics or want to be an artist who happens to draw comics so that if comics don't work out, you can still get this gratification writing something else or doing art in some other way. And seriously, that applies to all ages. It, it, if you're six, uh, if you're in sixth grade, if you're 26, it's about passion and it's about following up and committing to it. Because it's industry. Oh, sorry. Uh, because just working on my own project, there's, you know, especially in the beginning, of course, there were several times where it's like, oh, the script I wrote here calls for a certain kind of car and I've never drawn a car before in my life. And then you have to study pictures and this is what a car looks like this is how it works this you have to have all that in your mind before you can put it on the page so yeah it, it does help to pull in sources from other things you're gonna have to know what cars look like you're gonna have to know how to draw buildings in perspective because you create the world as you put the whole thing down and that's not just the characters uh jumping around on rooftops yeah, I think the um, one of the examples I always use is this happened to me very early on. I, I don't even think I had been in the business a year. And I was drawing a couple of Batman stories that were written by Jerry Conway. And he had it set in a circus. 
I've never gone to damn circus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he, clowns, and, man. Yeah, and the and the script describes them walking through the circus, and um, you know, here's a uh, one of the trailers that has a tiger in it, and here's the big top and all this stuff. It's like I've never gone that. <laughs> uh, and and that is what the job is, though. That mm -hmm. I have asked other writers or uh, other artists to draw things that they had never thought of drawing, but I, as writer said, well, this is what the story is, you know? And I think um, that's a realistic aspect of where we are, that it's, you aren't just gonna walk in and drop guys in tights and capes and, you know, women with magic golden lassos or whatever. It's, you have to be able to draw a lot more than that. So you might as well figure it out in your younger days. People having coffee, people driving cars, you know, the boring stuff that happens when they're living their lives too. Yeah, or even more importantly, you know, figure out how to draw someone drawing a car, driving a car, and make it interesting. It isn't just, yeah. making them, you know, showing them with their hands on the wheel. It is angle the camera and you handle figure the out lighting the camera in such a way that it's not just them doing it, but interesting for the reader to look at. Absolutely. With, with everything changing, too. So when you started, we didn't have Google for you to do for reference, right, for anything right. that you might not know. So how did, you, how did you go back and find that? Was it the library? Did you have to watch it television? Was, I, I did it um, one of two ways. One was, you had just mentioned it, and it was the library. You know, I used to go to the library quite often and have to look up reference. Uh, when I started green, doing Green Arrow, I remember going to the library and finding everything I could on archery just so I could make sure that the way I drew it was accurate. Uh, it was set in Seattle, so I went to... Um, uh, the bookstore and ordered several different books on Seattle just so I could have the geographic location accurate. And the other one is I used to subscribe, yes, subscribe to print magazines. Um, <laughs> These print to, magazines you talk about? Magazines, yeah, and I used to get a bunch of magazines and I built clip art files. And all artists did that. You know, you'd, you'd clip out, oh, here's uh a story on jet airplanes, so I'll cut out the airplanes. Here's a story on Yugoslavia, so I'll cut out these pictures of these scenes. And everybody built, built up a file of photo reference that way. And, and you'd sit down like once every two months to do that. It was just part of what you did. That's incredible. That's what's always so good now is, is with Google Images, you know, I when I'm working on my stuff, it's always, if you're not sure how to draw something, find a picture, or take a picture real quick. It's the easiest way than just trying to hammer it out over and over again from your head. Yeah, and what I see a lot of times now, though, is people using the same pictures. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, come on, let's do a little more work here. Absolutely. There's a little, I think you can definitely tell in particular when I go back, even watching old, older cartoons, the amount of imagination that went into some of these background scenes even, um, and some right. of these comic books. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot more imagination than, than I think there is today. Yes. I it's agree. A lot more realism than today. Um, well, we've got a few more minutes here. So I wanted to get to the Facebook question. We have a couple of uh, media questions here. I've got three of them in front of me. Um, that I wanted to get out here before we run out of time. So there's a gentleman, James Chan, uh, wanted to know if you could do another Marvel character, whether you wrote or drew, um, who would that be? Um, it would be one of two, I would say. Uh, because I did Spider-Man, but I never really did Peter Parker's Spider-Man. So that might be one. The other one, as I said earlier, Tony Stark, Iron Man. I, I find, and I've always found, um, that to be an absolutely fascinating character. I would love to see that. Yeah, I think you'd do great with that character. Um, and then he also wanted to know, what's the best advice that someone gave you coming into the comic book industry? I, I, I think that the best advice was um, someone who explained to me, it was Mike Rowe, very early on, that this is a job, treat it like a job. and And, I always did, and I've seen so many people come in who treat it more like a not a job. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I, I won't go into detail, but I, I really think the, the best thing that I was ever told and tried to adhere to is that this is a job, it's a profession, make it one. 
and it is uh, an industry that is rife with um, a lack of professionalism and some people never seem to figure it out and I'm not one of them. So I, I think that's the yes, bigger is just just realize what it is. And so once you're here, you know, it's your career, safeguard it, take care of it and grow it. Absolutely. Because uh, I remember what I watched uh, Doug Mankey give a little spiel at um, when he's in Sioux Falls and talked about the amount of work it takes. And I didn't realize how much work you guys put into this, but it is like we said earlier, it's like all the time. Um, you know, he's drawing all the time. Yeah, There's Doug is. And, and, you know, Doug is um, one of these guys who puts in, you know, I know. And he Doug puts in incredible hours and incredible amounts of time. And often because he would get scripts far later than he should have and have to still get a book done in a really condensed amount of time. And he does it. And not only does he do it, but he does it and it looks great. And that's that's commitment and talent and perseverance. And, you know, Doug embodies that. Absolutely. Um, so Doug White would like to know, he has this on Facebook, how does he get your autograph? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? Well, okay, it's, it's certainly gotten a lot harder in um, these days without conventions that happen in person. Um, once we're back to having cons, that's still the best way. Uh, and, and I know we're going to be announcing something fairly soon where I'm going to be signing autographs um, for a company that you can do it that way. But the best way is really when conventions are back, um, you'll have the chance to get out and meet us in person once again, where we can actually sign your books on the spot. That's still the best way to do it. And you're you're regular at like spring con and, and fall con up in up in the cities, correct? That's something. Yep, I am. And then I typically hit, you know, six to seven other conventions throughout the year. And with the United States, what I try and do is make sure that I hit geographic areas as part of that. So I'll try and get, you know, Pacific Northwest, uh, northeast along the coast, southeast, southwest, uh, maybe do something in Texas. So I try and at least get some sense of geographic representation in my schedule. I have had some of the best experiences of my entire life at those conventions. So you and your peers make them definitely once or a few times in a lifetime experiences, but I, I remember each one very fondly. Yeah, you know, I think that um, what has happened is that over a number of years. I mean, when, when I first started, uh, there were cons, but not like we have them now. And, and they have become so much bigger and so much a part of the social fabric of people's lives as they go to different cons. And so, you know, it used to be that people would just go to whatever con was in their backyard or no con at all. And now the amount of people like you, Ryan, that I see traveling all over to get... <laughs> different conventions it's, Me, it's really no. amazing. and you know what the, the the midwest has some really good cons and so we've got uh in the twin cities area we've got a couple of nice cons um in uh kansas city there are a couple of great cons you have c2e2 in chicago so we we have conventions that people can go to where they don't have to like drive two days to get to you, you can do it in you know six eight hours at worst and i think i think we're fortunate to have that absolutely and we would love to have you in person at supercon uh, we'll make it happen one day yes that's excellent that'd be awesome yeah. um shane and i were just talking about how cool it is that you you agreed to do this we really appreciate it um actually you were top of my list all five years so, oh, sure. uh, <laughs> so well at least it's this much right <laughs> absolutely yeah. Um, before we go, um, I would love to ask you a question because I don't know if you get asked this ever. Um, but what is a question that people don't ask you that you always hope they ask in interviews? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Uh, Clever. I don't know if it's if it's um, if it's that simple. You know, I I think I think what I would say is. Uh, recently, I was on um, part of DC Fandome. It was 
Jean Luen Yang and Brian Michael Bendis and I were on a panel. And Brian was coordinating it and, and um, kind of asked the questions. And I said, okay, but when we get to the end, Brian, I get to ask you a question. And th the question I asked him was, how has writing Superman, first of all, has it changed you? And then how has it changed you? And I think when we get into questions, um, everyone says, well, you know, how did you break into comics? And I think really it is, what I ask creators is something more along the lines of what motivates you? You know, what, what keeps you going in comics? What is it that you enjoy at the end of the day that makes you keep doing it? Um, you know, it's, it's things like that. And these are more subtle things. And I think those are always good questions to ask people. So Dan, what motivates you to keep doing comic books? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's weird that um, I enjoy the process of working and telling the stories. And I, well, the reason I say it's weird is because a, a secret little trick or, you know, a little secret in general is there are a lot of guys who don't enjoy working. They enjoy having the book done. They enjoy, you know, going to conventions or whatever, but they don't necessarily enjoy the process of working. And this gets into what we touched on earlier because it is a lot of hard work and it's a tremendous commitment. And I think what works for me is still um, all these years later, and I've done this for a long time, that when I get to the end of the day, if, if I just am wrapping an issue and I can read it and say, I like this, this feels good to me. I like the way this story came out. I like where we're at with this character. That's what still motivates me. And it is to get interested in the story and to have the chance to work on it and get interested myself. Because if I'm interested, um, that's what I use to gauge in hopes that that will also make the reader interested. Um, it, Dick Giordano, uh, who is a great, great editor and anchor, uh, artist in his own right, once said that as far as he's concerned, it's the job of the writer to excite the artist job of the penciler, if it's broken down that way, to excite the anchor, for their job to excite the colorist on down the line till the entire team excites the readers. And I think that's 100% true. And when you get that happening, that's why I still do it. That's what motivates me. When you can get the letterer excited, that's when you know you got a good issue. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and I can see that just as uh, your perspective and, and professional's perspective too, because we all start out as fans. And if you read an issue that you've done at the end and as a fan still go, oh, this is great. There's there's a great likelihood that fans that are picking up the book are, are going to think the same thing. Yeah, very true. Absolutely. Yeah, and I feel like, I don't know, I don't want to speak for you here, but I, I feel like you probably have that feeling pretty often. Um, I, I couldn't imagine getting <laughs> done with the death of Superman and looking at that finished product and not being like, this is going to change everything. And like knowing it was going to that that had been amazing and to well we didn't you know when i got done writing and drawing it i didn't know that it was going to change everything although by that time you know we knew it was going to be kind of a big deal but we had no idea that it was going to be as big as it was uh but yeah to this day i still you know i'll i'll, I'll send in a script and the emails oh i really like how this came out i hope you do too and you know i think that's what it's about. It's, it's having a certain sense of enthusiasm for what it is that you do, because that's what keeps you on track. If it ever gets to be drudgery, you know, it's time to step off that book. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited to see all the new stuff you've got coming out, um, told and untold today. So um, thank you so much for your time, man. We there. appreciate it. Yep, we will absolutely be there. <laughs> be over at Rainbow Comics, buying them up. So, no, it's so. it's uh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, and you know, good luck with SuperCon. And I, I hope you have a lot of people tune in, and hopefully, it won't be long before everybody can get together and do this in person. Agreed. And, and yeah. if I could just uh, at the end here say one thing, I, I alluded to earlier about everyone having a story about how they decided that comics was for them as a profession and i just without going into too much detail my personal story dan directly involves you and you have been 
my inspiration for all these years. I just want to take this chance to say thank you for everything you've done and everything that you continue to do. And it's all been great. It's my pleasure, Ryan. Uh, it always has been. And be sure to say hi to the rest of the family for me. Sure. I, I was, I was going to, I was going to do that and say, well, should I do this on the camera like this? But uncle Dan would kill me if I didn't say hi. And <laughs> grandma says hi too. Okay. Right back at him. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dan. My pleasure.